Well, thank you. Um, thank you, I'm Mary, for your introduction and for your nomination. Thank you, uh, Jim and Percy. Thanks, thanks to the Voice of Hope. You, I have been working with your group for a few years now, mm -hmm. and uh, I never formally actually got coming to something like this. Um, this is, this is a, not just an honor for myself. This is an honor for people who work in the mainstream medicine, but I try to push to more than what we have nowadays is getting more and more non-mainstream, but have been existed for a very long time, those healthcare or wellness methods into the mainstream practices. So we are in that movement. We have been working with this, work on this field for many years. I'm mean, just one of the little drop of the sea or the, the, the little piece in the, this whole, whole um, uh, wave. And what I want to see is this is not just honor for me. This is honor for people who work in there so that we are going to be make it one way or other because this is not just about who is getting better. This is about how our human being as, 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 as existent, how we're going to survive in this whole you know, change of profit-oriented healthcare. So that's, that's what, what, what I think this is a, you know, it's a very, I, I feel being honored, of course, to receive this uh, award, even though I don't know what it is about. <laughs> <laughs> but I really feel just so many of us in the field, we get in together once in a while and found out we need people to hear our voice. So today I sort of got a chance to talk to the politicians, but not, now, not like I'm gonna count on James to bring my voice to the politician next door. <laughs> Um, as you can see, I, I give you the flyer. Um, I work with cancer patients, and my, most of my job is work with addiction patients, okay? And I teach addi addiction patients meditate, teaching them breathing so they can you know, feel better, less craving, and less, less the, 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 the withdrawal symptoms. But I found out, you know, compared to the addiction patient, the cancer patient is more likely to take my message and in, in the, put, it, put them into a practice because Cancer is such a life-threatening uh, uh, disease. People feel like if this is can save their stress, can save their uh, anxiety management, this may save their life. So they put more time to the, com to, to the practice. So I really kind of open to this opportunity to on this line our work to new and more. So that's why I actually choose the topic on the cancer recovery. And even though I have many other subjects I might talk about, but I think this one will represent what University of Maryland Center for Integrated Medicine try to promote. We represent what the people in the company mentally and alternative medicine feel, try to promote, to tell the mainstream medicine this big voice outside the, the, the healthcare coverage should be taken care of, should be let, let more people know about it and benefit from this line of knowledge. Uh, before I go going further, I would like to really kind of, uh, you know, not, not only a pre, uh, thanks to the voice, voice of for hope, the organization, but also just uh, my students from my class is coming in, giving me the support because without them, I don't have a class. <laughs> um, I also really want to thanks to my family and my son, my daughter, and my wife. They come in supporting me all my all my career, and I, I think without them, I I, I won't have I won't have it today. So, but the to topic I'm covering today, probably everybody can can get a little bit idea. I want to start with some very interesting statistics about cancer fields. Uh, about 100 years ago, the, the chance, the risk to getting cancer is one out of 30. That's when we have statistics in the populations. You know, in 1970s, when Nixon declared war on cancer, we have less than one in five, you know, chance to getting cancer. Nowadays, it's one in two in men and one in three in women. So whatever we're doing to the cancer, we miss something important. We are not on the target. I mean, when more and more people getting a sickness, you spend so much effort to try to fight a war with, you know you're doing something wrong. So that's what I want to say. Why are people getting cancer in the first place? Do we know that answer? Yes, if you go to the NCI's website, you'll get about 12 risk factors, okay? So just summarize here very quickly. You age, as you're getting older, you're more likely to get cancer. Uh, alcoholics are more likely to get cancer. Uh, there's not a cancer causing uh, substance in the environment. There's a whole list there, of course. That is become what we call the environmental factors. Uh, and then chronic inflammation, your diet, and the diet, if you look at my slide, is that the arrow up means you increase your risk. 
So arrow down means it decrease your risk. So you have um, ca causing, you have a rich causing in your body or de decrease risk for cancer. That's what it means, okay? Um, the Im immune suppression, that's another area, especially the people who after the organ transplant, you have to suppress the immune system, they're more likely to have cancers. And the people who have HIV, uh, they're more likely to have cancer. So that's the area of kind of um, scientific support. And also the infections aging, that's many of them listed there. Uh, obesity is associated with cancer. A hormone change uh, her or hormone disorder was associated with cancer. Radiation exposure, and including x-ray, the one we try to diagnose of cancer, also caused cancers. And this is the one with controversial. Sunshine, they think that UV radiation will cause skin cancer. But as far as I know, there's two stories you should hear at the same time. 100 years ago, most of us work outdoor, so we're exposed to the sun. We have one out of 30 people have cancers. Now we stay inside, don't get much sunshine, we get one out of two get a cancer. So that is a very questionable risk factors. But also scientific evidence point out the sunscreen actually causes cancer, not the sun itself. So I don't know, this is the area, I really put a two question mark there, we need more research on. And uh, actually the one D, vitamin D deficiency, is one of the highest risk factors for cancer. Because uh, the research found out that if we have no vitamin D deficiency, 77% of people's cancer will not happen in the first place. 77%, that's the vitamin research, D. yeah, vitamin D. Yeah, vitamin D com combined with calcium, if we have enough for these two, will reduce the cancer risk by 77%. So that, that, that is, that, that's where the vitamin D comes from, okay? So keep that in mind. So of course, uh, sm smoking causes cancer. That's not, not a secret anymore. So what I want to see, point out is, we, we have something very important missing in this national list of risk factors. Let's talk, talk about the cancer fact right now, okay? In 2007, we're, we're gonna have almost 1.7 million people will de detect with new cancer cases, okay? And about 600,000 of them, not 600,000 of them, 600,000 cancer patients gonna die in this year. Uh, about two out of five people will have the risk to diagnose cancer in their lifetime. This is all national, I mean, the, the, the national published statistics. So national expenditure for cancer care, we don't have the new number yet. This is out of the date number. In 2010, it's about $125 billion a year. Well, we, since we only you know, make a small salary, we don't know how big that number is. That number is one third of hospital cost in these countries. That's how big the number is. So with these many people, this amount of money is spent in something, uh, one disease, you, you, you assume the scientist or healthcare professional know what they're doing, right? <laughs> of course, they should know what causes cancer, so how, can they, how they can treat cancer. Well, unfortunately, this is the article published in this year's Science Magazine, okay? And they found out you know, after gen yeah. genetic and environmental factors, 66% of cancer patients mutation of the gene was not able to explain by their, what they know. So they called bad luck, you know. <laughs> Very unfortunate, this is this year. This year's, yeah, this year's uh, articles. So, so now this is the question, they miss something very important. Actually directly cause cancer or affect cancer recovery. And I can see very easily one is mental and psychological factors. Like uh, depression, anxiety, they definitely have a higher rate of cancer among those them. And uh, cancer phobia was the direct leading cause of death for cancer patients. And especially the stress or related stress related hormone. Those things never get in, in risk factor of cancer. I'm gonna present you some research today. And of course, social and emotional factor, that's another area has been very, very difficult to collect data, like uh, conformities, hostile environment in the way you work, and complain about what's going on, jealous about other people's, or forgiveness, unforgive or, or unforgive the people's you know, mistake or fault. That is area being seriously, seriously related to cancer occurrence and cancer recovery, but never being accounted for in the risk factors. So let's get, do a very brief review. What is cancer we're talking about? Well, generally, right now, we consider cancer is a general term for a group of about 100 unique diseases characterized by uncontrolled growth 
and the spread of amanova cell. Okay, that's kind of a, everybody agreed the definitions. So we're talking about 100 unique different disease and using the one name, almost you know, similar strategy to treating them. And uh, we know cancer originally are normal and healthy cell mutated genetically so that they can live in an environment where oxygen is real. And we know cancer is a result from an effort to survive in a toxic and a sick internal environment. The cell panic due to a lack of food, water, oxygen, or space. So in other words, cancer may not be the cause of a sickness, but it's a sickness of the body caused the cancer. So to treat cancer as if it was an illness without removing its underlying cause is nothing but a medical more practice. Because right now, that's what, what medical field is doing. They only try to treat the cancer, treat the tumor. They surgery, surgery rem remove the cancer and follow with chemotherapy because they know the cancer is going to come back, but they don't know where they come back. They're doing chemotherapy anyway. So that's what we, where we are and how we're doing that. But the traditional Chinese medicine will see cancer differently. Traditional Chinese medicine thinks cancer is a just a life status. It's not, the, the itself is not a sickness, it's just a life status. It is because a slowing or a stasis of the qi blood flow in the body, we call it the blockage or, or deficiency of the zheng qi. When you don't have enough zheng qi, your body has a deficiency. In those areas, they have difficulty to flow with the uh, normal metabolism. And they will have some, some, something like a, a liquid, some saliva-like liquid, liquid, and eventually become uh, materialized into tumor. So the treatment, sometimes they may have external uh, toxic, like environmental factors, but they have to work with your internal environment. They have to have the right environment to stay in your body to form a tumor. So treatment in Chinese medicine always focus on the internal environment, cultivate the zheng qi, and dispel the xie. Xie means the toxin or, or the, or the uh, ever, ever change. So, but the treatment of cancer itself, like a cure the cancer, is only third. It's not even most important things in treatment of cancer. The mainly are change the environment, change the environment to cultivate the zheng, and uh, uh, break the blockage, and detox the, 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 the toxin material. So, so Chinese always said, you know, the cancer, the growing the cancer is because the environment make them so. Like orange, orange always green in south, become very sweet orange food, right? If you move the moon tree to the north, it, in Chinese we call it zi. I don't know what is the English name. It's very bitter and dry food. It's not good to eat. So you cannot bring the, the, the zi. It's because the environment, not, this is not good for them to, to grow. They need to go back to the south in order to become sweet oranges. Uh, maybe, maybe the salad is the English yeah. word, okay? Zi. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, zi. yeah. So that's, that's the Chinese treatment of philosophy. I want to go a little bit further, I can give you an example. In Chinese medicine, qi is a very important concept. We always talk about cold and damp qi is a source of many sicknesses. So let's assume there's one sickness is due to cold and damp qi. I'm used the example of the uh, wood mushroom, okay? In Chinese, we call it more. Okay, we assume the wood, wood mushroom, okay, this is a fungus, it's a, it's, a, it's a piece of sickness we need to get rid of. So the Western medicine basically do is they cutting it, they cutting the wood, wood, wood mushroom. And when they cut it on the top, they grow on the bottom. They cut it the left, they grow on the right. Because they did not change the environment that grew the wood mushroom in the first place. But the Chinese medicine said, hey, that's because the, the wood becomes so damp and so cold areas, that's why they grow in the, the, the wood mushroom. Let's just move it to the sun, and let it dry, or the wood mushroom will disappear. So if you're looking at the sickness, a lot of the sickness is actually related to the cold and damp qi. That is how Chinese medicine treated them. They changed the environment instead of treating the symptoms. Later on, I will give you an example on this one, okay? I will actually give you an example how can quickly, quickly remove or shrink that uh, fibroid in the uterus. Mm -hmm. So now let's talk about the stress and the cancer. We only, we have a lot of negative emotion in our life. You know, we're getting anger, we're getting worry, we're getting anxious, we're getting complaining, we got, you know, many negative emotion in our life. From physical perspective, a lot of our negative emotion was expressed in the physically by stress response. We call it stress response. 
fight and flight response. Those response has been characterized by some chemical or hormone, hormone change in the bodies. So in the laboratory study, we found out that stress actually helped speed up the tumor growth in mice. So we know that. But in humans, we don't have hard evidence like a stress in you, see whether you're going to get a tumor or not. We don't have that, that kind of data yet. <laughs> However, we do have evidence on the cortisol, OK? Stress causes the body to release a lot of cortisol. And cortisol provides a perfect environment for cancer growth in four aspects. Number one, when cortisol being produced on the stress response, so they will switch off the immune system because you don't you need an immune system in a stressful situation. It's a fight or, or, or flight. You don't need that. So they shut it out in order to use the resource for something else. And they deplete the body's adrenaline. Even though you, you produce more adrenaline, but it be used for the stress response, the body, the area who need adrenaline, don't have it because they've been used for that fight and flight response. And still, they create an acidic environment yeah. that is very friendly to the cancers. Uh, and also increase glucose within the systems. Glucose is, the cancer cell need about three to five times glucose in order to complete the metabolism than the normal cell. So glu glu glucose create a very friendly environment. So people who have cancer need to really pay attention to what you eat. That's, that's one of the major things you need to watch out. <clears throat> so now we talk about a direct human study, cancer and stress. Among the, this is a systematic review, by the way, published in uh, 2008. Uh, among 165 studies on the normal pop, uh, health population, they found out the stress are associated with higher cancer incidence in the initial healthy population. That is very significant uh, finding. And then among the cancer patients, this is 330 studies, the poor survival rate in patients with a diagnosis of cancer, the cancer was noted in 330 studies. That means if you have a stress, you're more likely to uh, have, you have less sub chance to survive the cancer. And the next studies, the next uh, review said, the 55 studies said, they have a higher cancer mortality rate among the stressed patients. So literally, you already had the cause relationship there, except you have not using a study to stress people out, to see whether they cause cancer or not. We don't have that yet. But you have data suggests two other directions. Three weeks ago, there's a talk in NIH. Uh, the topic is lacing and, and, and the pressure, the public health consequences of stress in, in Americas. This is uh, the 19th US Surgeon General, uh, Dr. Murphy. He delivered a lecture at NIH, and he called out his own observation, not a statistic, his own observation and some study. 90 to 95% of people has have reported some very stressed or stressed out episodes in their life but only 5% of people know how to deal with it. That means we have tens of people in, out there have stressed out, don't know what to do with it. And we are not addressing the key health issue. That's his original words. We are not addressing the key health issues. With so much money, so many healthcare professionals, we have not addressed the key health issue yet. So let's look at the stress and health in the United States. According to uh, American Medical Association, that's a JAMA, and American Psychological Association. 80 to 90% of the e initial doctor visitor is related to psychological factor, related to stress. 80 to 90%. And stress is related to six major causes of death. That's according to CDC's uh, statistics. And according to AP American Psychological Association, 70% of adults suffering from advanced physical reaction by stress. According to Dr. Barry, she has, she has a book. Um, I, brought, I brought a copy of the book just for people in case that you're interested in, the Forgiveness Project. According to Dr. Barry, 61% of cancer patients has unforgiveness issues. That means there's one person in their, in their life, they cannot forgive them. They would rather you know, live, in, live with that. Mm -hmm. And then according to our recent, recently statistic by, by some uh, uh, top uh, re research scientists, psychosocial stress has been one of the key factors associated with cancer initiation, growth, and metastasis. So that's the reality we deal with. How about the cancer field itself? Well, the cancer field, we know most oncologists have little stress management training, cannot provide relevant service. We know that. 
And uh, most importantly, if you look at the hospital, a few hospital or cancer center invite psychologists in consultation, planning, or implementation of a cancer treatment program. Although study has shown that fear of cancer is the heading, is the leading cause of a tre cancer treatment failure. So they are, they are counting on the patient to see the psychologist themselves. It's not going to happen. Because most of the cancer patients, first, they don't have time. And second of all, they don't have that courage to go to see psychology because they all have physical health. They don't want the people, they don't want their colleague consider them crazy because they feel like there's a stereotyping when people see psychologists, they must something wrong. So this is an issue where all everybody was looking at. Now look, let, let's look at the top leader in this country. National Cancer Institute have a national cancer advisory board who determine who get money for cancer research. There's 16 experts in that board. This is just one prevent, expert in preventive medicines. There's zero psychologist in that board. And then the recently, of course, there's a new cancer moonshot programs. Okay, uh, it's initialized by, by by the former Vice President Joe Biden. He donated a huge amount of money, and the government put some money in. They have this new cancer programs called the moonshot. So they have a blue ribbon committee for that moonshot program to review the final grant to give money to different project. In this 28 member expert moonshot uh, blue ribbon panel. This one preventive medicine expert, okay, that's uh, Dr. Ho from Northwest University, zero psychologist. There's no space for stress management in cancer treatment at all. Why, we, why does this happen? We all know stress is the number one issue in health. We know stress causes cancer. Stress makes cancer patients less than survive. And we also know cancer phobia is a leading cause of, of treatment failure. Why we did not put a stress into our cancer treatment? I, I try to answer that question myself. Until recently, I'm meeting a very special healer in China. I got an answer to it. That answer is number one, there's no direct cause, right? There's no direct cause. Cancer will stress somebody will get, get in there, or you stress somebody will get in cancer. We don't have that yet. So that means the doctor was not obligated to treating stress. You cannot sue them for more practice because there's no evidence yet. Now, they, they always can see that, right? So doctor was, was kind of immune from being sued by the, by, the, by the center or hospital not to have a stress management center. That's number one. Number two is even though you put a psychologist or put a stress management center in the cancer center, they don't have many effective therapy yet. I mean, you talk about the whole country and the stress, right? And uh, why they didn't get treated? There's not many effective treatment as a therapy. That's like a prescription therapy available. And the, the reason I want to find this one too is at uh, this therapy I'm going to introduce to you actually can solve both problems at the same time. That's how wonderful it is. That's called emotional thoughting therapies. Emotional thoughting therapy is combining the energy therapy, combined meridian theory in Chinese medicine, and the channeling that can be from medicine perspective or from psychological perspective. Basically, this therapy was based on this kind of theory. He said, everything we have, wealthy, marriage, health, career, family, are uh, expressed in the form of material or life energies. OK, life energy in Chinese we call it qi. The emotion is the biggest exhausting source of life energies, which is the root cause of most mind confusing, bodies distressing, and relationship conflict. So negative emotion at the use, if not released properly, might be stored in human mind to form an emotional memory, a seed or a virus. You know, when the proper condition exposed, those seeds growing become a big issues like a tumor or sickness. And of course, last one, many physical sickness could be result of such emotional memory. So emotional thoughting therapy basically is a unique treatment system based on close emotion disease relationship by applying traditional Chinese medicine meridian theory, energy balancing, and psychotherapy to hope channeling patients' emotional suppression or disturbance through energy blockage point and inner dialogue so as to reduce or eliminate the emotion-related physical disease or discomfort. The frequently used method including uh, emotional memory identification, emotional channeling dialogues, emotional release, and energy blockaging dredging. 
etc. There's only like a four or five major methods being used in that. We were, in our tool, we tried to learn three of them, but we only get a chance to learn like two. We didn't get a, too many questions like during Dr. the Ball. Dr. Bao. That's what I talk about, yeah. Um, so this is a recent publication uh, with uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Tisha Bao. Uh, this is about an examination of relationship between emotional disturbance and the tumor. It's a two case studies. I don't want to do the whole case study. I want to use this as a published study in the International Journal of Clinical Psychiatry and Mental Health. So if you're interested in, drop me an email. At the end of the presentation, we'll have my email address. I'll send you the articles, OK? That's in English? That's in English, yes. Um, so the, the case number one is a 46 years old business woman who found out a huge fibroid in her uterus during the regular checkup. And it's, we'll talk about uh, 97 times 72, really big, big one, yeah. Um, she came to the emotional social therapy workshop and tried to get a treatment. This is after I met with Tisha Bao, because I said, you need a document. So he has that consciousness. He asked for the, for the ultrasound, and he says, can you do one ultrasound after we treatment? He said, sure. So, so basically, the treatment is very simple. You need to start with simple conversation or start acupressure. And uh, the therapist press her yao yan, OK, this, this point. And she found, oh, very sensitive, very painful. So she, the, the, the therapist got, what kind of life experience you have will cause you this kind of pain? And the conversation said, oh, I, when I found out my, my husband had uh, you know, uh, extramarital affair, you know, the, the whole conversation is about how he feel uncomfortable, how he feel upset, but he cannot confound him with her husband to point that out. So he was just suppressed the emotion, but feel very disturbing. And then the, the therapy section recognized that the brain, the husband, imaginary husband, in front of her, let her speak out. Let her speak out what she needed to say, but have not said to, to him during that time. Only a few minutes of this talk out, and you push this point again, no more pain. That's how emotion can relate to the body physical symptom directly in Chinese meridian theory, because each emotion is correspond to a specific meridian system. They can use that theory to be able to diagnose or treating the patients. And uh, of course, if you read the original one, you can see that the whole conversation was there. And what happened is one treatment, about 40 minutes later, and she went back, see, the next day she went back. She came in July 9, so July 10 she went back. It's already shrinked about 30%. There's no more treatment. One month later, it shrinked about 50%, that two months, without any other treatment. Just one section, emotional thousands of You experience it yourself, David, right? You experience it yourself. That, that is very powerful. And I think uh, Susan from North Carolina, she was really touched during that section. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the second case. It's a 47 years old woman, very similar situation, <laughs> business woman, and during the physical exam, found a, a median site, uterial fibroid. And this time, they was doing the Guan Yuan in the fun, fun point, and found out some very discomfort. So the, quest, the conversation, instead of going into extra marital affair, they go into the relationship. The first is with the father, relationship with the father. She, she's more close to the father than the mother. But when her father passed away, she was not there. She didn't get a chance to say last words to, to, to her father. So she, the, the therapy is able to create an environment, to create the, the, this interaction, to let, let her speak out to her father. I said, I was, had so many other things going on. I couldn't say the last words. This is what I want to say to you. Give her the chance to channel out that, 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 that suppression of emotion. And then her pain in the area will disappear. So this lady went two sections. And the second section talk about her relationship with her mom. Because uh, her mom, she feel her mom always love her brother more than her. So she feel being kind of uh, not loved enough by her mom. But in reality, now she has children herself. Old mother now the children, now, now the child. But it's because the younger brother is younger. The mother has to pay more attention to him. Now she understands that. So she kind of like channeling that out, release that attention. After two sections, this is what happened. This is just a completed emotional social therapy. There's too much drink from 47, 46 to 17 and 16. That's about more than 90% of reduction in two sections of emotional social therapies. So this is, this is a very good example. This is very significant because it confirms the emotion and the disease relationship by simply remove the emotional tension, the disease change. That is really that relationship very 
uh, causally. And then the treatment of tumor can start with resolve some emotional blockage or suppression. We don't have to do the surgery immediately. We can do in something else before we do in that dramatic surgeries. Effectively help patient let go of harmful emotion or emotional suppression or regain the inner peace and inner balance that is more important than remove a sickness or remove a discomfort. Because what we talk about health is not just physical, but also psychological and spiritual. This method can do in three things at the same time. So it's really very important. I know this is not, we're not talking about cancer yet. This is just a, a benign tumor. But it has this, at least it has some common characteristics of cancers. It's a stuck, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a blockage in the, in the, in the body. It is a new, mutated cell, normal cell. It has that characteristics. So this, this method introduced the meridian theory in the emotional disease relationship. It achieved both physical and mental health during that treatment. Actually, I brought a uh, teacher about a new book in, and it's called Thought Change Disease. Unfortunately, it's still in Chinese, but I just want you to know, this is his 16th book, and he's younger than me. <laughs> yeah. He's really very productive. He's in the field, really in the frontier of health and wellness development. So if you want to know more, and this is his website. That's a, that's a Chinese website. And this is where you can find the article, the one I just showed you. And if you really, really have time, you're welcome to come with us. We're, we're actually going to go to China in two weeks. And this is actually our group when we, when we have the emotional thoughts and therapy section with teacher boss. Probably by now you know I'm the faculty who teaching Qigong in the medical school. <laughs> and actually I'm teaching cancer patient Qigong. So I want to kind of briefly, briefly uh, kind of summarize that area because I want to, you know, Qigong is one of the best stress management tool we can find at this moment. Uh, there's a huge literature in Chinese about Qigong therapy for cancers. And mostly observational study and clinically, that's before and after. And now the many randomized control trials being done in China for cancer patients to use Qigong. However, there are many, many studies in the laboratory to give the mice or give the cancer cell Qigong, excellent Qi, healings. And it's very positive in that area. So that means uh, tens of evidence the Qi will inhabit the cancer group in the laboratory situations. But in the clinical situation, is most of the, uh, the, the, the published study is positive, but not a randomized control trial as less credited. There are many Chinese uh, Qigong school, but not many Chinese Qigong school actually take cancer patient as a Openly, except the two. The two Qigong school or Qigong uh, area, Qigong uh, uh, phone, were treat, openly said we can treat cancer patient. One of them is called Guoling Xin Qigong, another one is Tai Chi Five Vitamin Qigong. Long times ago, I did a review on the Chinese literature and found out that there are many in vitro, in vivo study been done with the excellent chi to inhibit the cancer group, but also there are some house, house based observation on a, on a huge study to follow in patients who go through Qigong therapy. They have um, significantly better than the people who don't go through, but not strictly in the con controlled trial. They just compare the general numbers. But recently, there are some Western English literature have been doing the systematic review on the randomized control trial of Qigong therapy versus other comparison group. And found out the, the cancer patients who go through Qigong are more likely to have a positive improvement for quality of life and the mood and the fatigue syndromes. And that also, the most recently, when this one is a study of 13 randomized control trial, found out Qigong had a positive effect on quality of life, fatigue, and immune function, and the cortisol levels. And in, in this review, one of the studies was actually funded by NIH, National Cancer Institute, one, uh, by the MD Anderson Group. They went to uh, Fudan University uh, School of Medicine to recruit breast cancer patients and ask them to practice uh, Guoling Qigong for six weeks. And compared to the waiting group, they are significantly better in terms of depressive symptoms and the quality of life and, and, and the immune systems. There, there was really, the, the study was published in cancer. It's one of the top research uh, journal in cancer, cancer field. So how could Qigong be helpful for cancer patients? From what I know, or from the literature suggesting, is 
Qigong hope the patient reduce the stress hormone, reduce cortisol, release the tensions. Qigong practice can improve the immune functions. I mean, this confirmed by in vivo and human studies. And Qigong practice increase the micro uh, circulation function, become more efficient in the met metabolism, and the Qigong energy might directly turn off the cancer cell produce apoptosis effects. That was in the laboratory study. And the Qigong therapy can raise the pain threshold. So that's what we know so far about the mechanism. But Qigong is really a very good therapy for stress management because they are trying to work on the mindset. You know, stress is not about what happened to you. It's how you respond to what happened. So you actually have a choice. So your mindset depends on your stress level, not what actually happened. So that uh, your performance is not determined by the how strong the stress is. It's how you think about the stress will affect you, will actually uh, uh, affect your uh, performance. So the Qigong work on your low action. Here and now, the mindfulness status, and being able to observe your thought, observe your emotion without taking action. That kind of training is very hopeful had to improve how people reduce or get rid of anxieties during the Qigong practice. And of course, there's a whole method to reach, uh, achieve that goals. And the second thing about Qigong as a stress management tool is Qigong use breathing as a, 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 as a special way to give you both mind and body relaxations. Like we found out when you meditate to let oneness status, like a, like a medi meditative status, your body automatically breathing at a resonant frequency. It's a very beneficial frequency will turn up your autonomic nervous systems. And all my students probably already learned that, that method, how to breathe breathing at resonant frequencies. And also traditional Chinese medicine believe your qi, your energy, go with your yi, go with your mind. So most of the time when people talk, talk about relaxation, you know, lay down in the couch, watch TV, their mind is still going out to look at the TV. So they still lose energy. But when you're doing Qigong, you close your eye, your attention inwardly. So you're not only relaxing, but also recharge yourself, get your energy through your attention, with the in, inward attention. So that's how I see Qigong really very unique or optimal way for stress management. And uh, as a scientist, I did a summary about how Qigong responds compared to stress response. You can see all, this, all the, you know, in terms of heart rate, immune system, blood pressure, and uh, respiratory, res respiratory rate is all to the opposite direction. You really, really need that, uh, uh, that attention from the stress response. Just summary continues, you know, adrenaline and the cortisol levels and the, and the, the insulin levels and your, your indicator of inflammation and your negative mood all being affected. In, by Qigong practice will reverse that effect due to stress response. Of course, the Chinese medicine always uses yin yang symbol as a way to explain that complicated relationship. Because your physical health, your sickness, is only the yang part of the, of the health. You have your mindset, your, your um, you know, psychological status, the yin side of the, your, your, your life is also going to affect your health. You need to treat both yin and yang in order to have completely healthy life. So I plan that, that theory, I start a special retreat in University of Maryland. So it's called a um, self-healing retreat for cancer patients and their families. We just finished uh, the, the number five retreat last week. So next one will be in May. So that's the week I will, I will come back to the United States, even though I got a job offer in China, but I promise my centers, I will continue holding the retreat because it's not easy. And probably just recognize this: it's not easy to teach in Qigong in a medical school, specifically to the cancer patient. There's so many barriers out there, but our center is so supportive. Let, let me make it realities, and then I want to continue that, that line of work to so give cancer patient an alternative, a place to go. The reason I present here is not only this retreat is teaching you Qigong, but also this retreat introduce the latest breakthrough in cancer therapy, you, the patient himself. Because a lot of the time, we are talking about the cancer treatment, we talk about the hospital, the doctor, the new therapy. We don't talk too much about how you are gonna get involved in that process. So the basic idea is current treatment is focused on the cancer or tumor itself, but not on the environment that produced the cancer in the first place. So that is why they have a such a high recurrence rate and a failure rate. So our therapies, all the therapies, 
work through your in internal environment, work through your immune, immune system and self-healing systems. So we need to work on that self-recovery system in order for the patient completely recovering from cancers. So real health is not just absentee of cancer or absentee of disease. It is actually a, a full mental and social balance and health. So the cancer phobia is one, I, I, this is the third time I'm seeing this. Cancer phobia is one of the leading cause of cancer treatment failure. So we need to do something about that through different channels instead of the treatment itself. We introduce the missed components in cancer therapy, the patient himself. We want to have the patient self-care and self-empowerment. So the number one issue in our retreat is change the attitude, search hope within. Because most people, most people with cancer tend to search for hope externally. The best hospital, the best doctor, the best treatment, the new treatment, you know, whatever is out there, is always out there. Now we want to change, how about here, inside here, because this is where the cause cancer in the first place. If we change the environment, maybe we don't need so much treatment. That is a key for my ideas. So external work, external help won't work or cure cancer unless you change the internal environment, which offer the place to cultivate a cancer group in the first place. And according to the Chinese medicine, or according to Qigong philosophy, everybody is a born a healer. We need to review and active that the healer within. So in our retreat, we cover five major areas. Okay? Number one is, like I said, attitude change. We try to tell our participant, cancer is not your enemy. Even though it's a fatal disease, but it is not your enemy. Because every man may have cancer from time to time in their life. But the body actually have a system to defend itself, to get rid of it. The fact that you are diagnosed as a you know, diagnosable cancer or tumor, and it means that something went wrong in that environment, or something is wrong in your lifestyle, your, uh, your relationship, your emotion. Something is wrong there. You need to do something to change that. Otherwise, if you don't change it, it will kill you, right? So that's what the message cancer tried to send to you. It's really along from the God or from the life. Tell you that, hey, you're doing something really serious wrong. You need to change it. So that's what we try to say. Cancer could become your friend if you treat it as appropriate way. Actually, some of my participants after the retreat, they actually re response said, you know, cancer probably is the best thing that's happening in my life because it makes me living a better, healthier lifestyle. That's, that's what we try to achieve, the attitude change. Instead of a scared of cancer, you actually make friends with cancer. And we try to break the three blended beliefs. In Chinese, we call it mixing, superstitious. But I think that's not accurate accurate translation. Blended beliefs means believing in something without a question, without asking the possibility that this may be not, not be right. So people who try to believe what the doctor said. You know, the doctor said you have was six months or one year leave. They believe in it, they knew six months and one year. And they believe what the science knows. That's what the science knows. 66% 6, 6, 6 of the people have cancer is due to bad luck. That's what you're going to get an answer to. Yes. So they believe what the master, the Qigong master can do. They found out that this Qigong master has been hope for a lot of cancer patients. They found the saver. They think the Qigong master will save their life. No. Without your participation, the Qigong master can do nothing. You are the one having to change everything. The Qigong master only gave you guidance. So that's what we try to break the three brand beliefs. And we want people believing in themselves, believing in their own internal environment, able to defend themselves and recover themselves. So that is the Golden Qigong group. They are doing the demonstration. Mm -hmm. The second area, we focus on stress and anxiety management. We know all the cancer patients have some stress. They worry about what's going to happen if I die. They worry about what, who is going to pay the mortgage, who is going to take care of my children, who is going to pay the tuition for, the, for, my, for my kids. So they worry a lot of things. So we want to people bring, this, bring the mindfulness technique, recognize it's OK to be worried. It's OK to be sad. It's OK to feel you know, angry from time to time. But you need to recognize that is not you. That's just your thought. Your body responds to the thought with, with the emotion. So if you know you are not your mind, you play mindfulness, one of the key issues, you are not your mind. You can observe your own thought, your own emotion, without getting involved in it. That is a skill, yes. So we actually have a whole stress management skill. I believe um, uh, Anne Mary was in my stress management introduction course a few weeks ago. So we have a whole theory how to be mindful of your breathing. 
And by focus on breathing, you're able to be here and now and without being carried away by your thought. What if you carry it away by your thought? Be mindful of your thought. Be mindful of your emotion. So don't let them carry you too far. Acknowledge that by labeling, oh, I'm angry. Oh, I'm a fear. I'm, I'm scared to death because I had cancer. It's OK to have that thought. But as long as you recognize that thought, what you do is you have a new beginner. That means you're watching yourself without being getting involved in take away by the thought. So that mindfulness training is very popular for our cancer patients. And of course, we also have to be mindful of your body and emo uh, spirit. Use mind-body connection, bring people to be more grateful to their life, to be more, uh, you know, live a healthier life routine, and uh, generate more gratitude and happiness instead of uh, scare and the depression and anxiety. We don't directly treat anxiety or fear. We bring people in meaning, values, gratitude in life through mindfulness, and then live, they live a better quality of life. That's what's happening. So based through this kind of stress managing program, we build a mindset. We call it a positive person and detached mindset. Detach means let go. You want to try your best, the outcome is not important. Yes, you, everybody are afraid of death, don't want to be dying. However, no matter how hard you, you try, the end of life is the same. So nothing to be afraid of. It's just a different way, different, different time to, to reach that goal. The third one, we're teaching the Qigong uh, system. We're teaching two evidence-based Qigong system. One is called Tai Chi Five Vitamin Qigong. It's a meditation, mainly meditation. One is Guoling Xin Qigong, mostly walking and you know dynamic Qigong form. These two Qigong form is easy to practice, and it's a, uh, it's a, has been proved hope a lot of cancer patient recovering. So one of the wonderful things about the Qigong is once you learn that, when you go home, you can practice every day. You can find a friend or group practice together, or you can practice on your own. It has been hope a lot of patient. And it's one of very effective way to generate energy and uh, uh, cultivate mindfulness. The fourth area we try to do is try to introduce some behavior and lifestyle change, which what we call reprogramming. Because we know Qigong actually have some study found out Qigong can generate epigenetic changes in human your bodies. And so we can find out where we need, they need help, can design a program in those areas. So we, we, first, we want people, instead of complaining, and to try to find a benefit in the life. What do they appreciate for? Become a benefit founder instead of uh, four founders in daily life. And then we, have, we focus on relationship issues. We have Dr. Uh, Nadia Linda Ho from Hawaii. She has been here three times. And focus on the relationship issue. How your relationship affects your health. How you can, through relationship, getting a happier lifestyle. Because we found out a lot of people's cancer like the example we gave to you. It's about relations. They have better relationship with the husband, had a better relationship with the parents, and they did not get that, that sense straight out. They become a chi blockage in the body and form a tumor. So that is the area we work on as well. And also, I gave, remember the example, 61% of cancer patients have unforgiveness issues. That is big issues. And uh, also, we have uh, introduced uh, daily healthy life routine and lifestyle through, through, from trad traditional Chinese medicine perspective. Try to minimize exposure to the electronic mag magnetic field. Try to introduce to healthy diet, diet and nutrition based on science and individualizations. Our nutrition course is very well perceived. Usually we've scheduled for two hours, we only run in for four hours because they got so many questions. Yeah, so we, because we have all the specific issues why certain, certain people have to go this way and the same kinds of patient, but because the body is different, they have to go other ways. It's individualized nutrition therapy, not just general principles, not just uh, 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 vegetarian is the best choice, not that. You can actually can, still can eat meat, you can still you know, take, a, take a, your, what are your favorite food, except you need to choose. You need to choose what to, what to eat. Mm -hmm. And the last one, and it's not the least important, is evidence-based self-healing techniques. We're sharing people with different techniques they can use on a daily life. Most, this is a part of the change the, uh, the, the attitude. In order, to change the, in order for them to change the attitude from search hope outside to search hope inside, we're teaching them self-healing skill. They can do it themselves. So now they can really totally depend on themselves. We teach in nutrition therapy, we just mentioned it. dietary supplement, how to select that. We teach them how to use, uh, use the water, turn the water into a 
healing therapies, information water. People say, what is information water? Well, if you hear about homeopathic medicines, that is information water because they use medicine and they make a special medicine and it's denoted, denoted. You can almost hardly find any molecular in there. They still have a healing effect because the healing message was already in there. Okay, so self acupressure that including the, the meridian system, the point hope pain relief, hope the uh, lower the blood pressure or some other symptoms. So people have a health issue, they can just simply a few acupressure to release symptoms. They know they have that potential to heal themselves. So you don't have to depend on medicine all the time. And then we have like um, grounding for discharging the positive ion and the electric electromagnetic field. And in Chinese we call it jie just, just barefoot sitting outside or walking barefoot can grounding yourself, getting that extra magnet, uh, electromagnetic field discharged. That one, the energy medicine, we've been talking about that all the time, right? Uh, and then we have um, fasting. We did not do fasting during the seventh day, but we do half do fasting afterwards. So like last week, we had a um, uh, retreat, and this week, we're going to have the fasting. So people actually come to have, in the retreat, we have about seven people were coming to the fasting because they hear about this, how good this is. Because during fasting, you are used the Qigong and the Taoism uh, techniques to gather in Qi, um, you know, re reduce the symptom and hope the detoxification process. At the same time, you, since you don't eat food, the, the cancer becomes so weak because they're hungry, they, they deserve, they, they, they're craving for not a close cause in order to complete the metabolism, in order to survive. Without food, they literally become so weak, you can use the Qigong to get rid of them very quickly. So it's one of the things we introduce them to, teach them how to do the total breathing, gobbling qi, but we don't actually do in fasting during the retreat. So that, that's basically the whole idea about our retreat. And thank you very much for your time. And now it's question. <laughs>